Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Data Race Talks are made possible by Ottitune. Learn how to automatically optimize your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottitune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. Today, another uh, exciting talk in the Vaccination Data Race Seminar Series. We're excited today to have Deepak Majedi. Uh, he's a principal engineer at HANA. Uh, it's a commercial version of PressoDB, and he's here to talk about Velux, the new engine that they're building for it. So Deepak is a, a principal engineer at Alhana. Um, prior to that, he was a tech lead at Advertica, um, and he has a PhD in compilers, not databases, from Rice University. So as always, if you have questions for Deepak, who's given the talk, uh, please unmute yourself, say who you are, ask a question at any time, and feel free to do this whenever you want, because otherwise he's just talking to himself. And we appreciate him being here with us, although he's in Pittsburgh, so he's like, you know, five miles from my house, but we're doing this over Zoom. So Deepak, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Andy. All right. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about Velox today, and this is the outline of my talk. Um, I'll start with a brief motivation for Velox. I'll then spend some time going over some of the highlights of Velox, uh, which include the API components in the design. Um, and then we'll see how we implemented a Presto worker using Velox. And then I'll finally conclude with some open source development exp experience. Yeah, Velox is open source. Um, all right, so why do we, why are we building Velox? Um, so if you look at the hardware and uh, uh, data trends, you'll see that um, data growth is significantly outpacing the hardware growth. And you know, I'm sure you already heard that before. And you also must have heard about the implications of near end of Moore's law and then scaling. Uh, and we already see some heterogeneity in processes today, and researchers are proposing dark silicon for the future. Uh, and as a result, data processing has become quite complex. Um, however, CPU speeds have stagnated, and memory has improved, but it's very expensive at the higher end. Uh, on the data processing side, we have various workloads, such as batch, analytical, streaming, and machine learning, and all of them employ some common features, such as joins, filter pushdowns, sorting, grouping, etc. Um, so, uh, and also building these execution engines is, is generally not uh, trivial. So it'll be, it'll be great to have a shared library that provides some optimized optimize implementations of this common uh, functionality. And at the same time, if, if we can extend uh, this library, it's much desired. And um, if we can consolidate these data process systems, that's also great. So to answer all these needs, uh, Velox is being developed uh, by the community it's as, a, as an open source project. All right, so what is uh, Velox? And, and uh, it's like I said, it's an open source C++ data processing acceleration library. Uh, it has building blocks uh, uh, and components for various data process to build various data processing frameworks. Um, so the goals are enabled to are, are to enable high performance, extensibility, and consolidation across these data processing uh, frameworks. Uh, it has a generic API that can be used across data processing frameworks. And uh, it is primarily, um, the engine is primarily vectorized, both the task and instru instruction level, very similar to the MonetDB X100 work. Uh, and um, the other uh, main benefit of Velox is open source. So it enables a lot, enables a lot of um, academic and industry R&D, a lot, lot more opportunities uh, because it's open source and it's uh, designed to be adaptive. Uh, for, for example, uh, filters, conjunct, conjuncts, and caching, uh, you will, we'll, we'll see those uh, are all sort of designed to be adaptive uh, and uh, general purpose. All right, um, so what is uh, Velox um, does not, what does Velox not have? So it does not have the traditional SQL parser, there's no data frame layer, there's no global optimizer, and it's not on the control plane. So that's all the responsibility of the client to uh, incorporate uh, those uh, in, 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 in parallel with Velox. All right, so what are some of the use cases of uh, Velox. So we already see a couple of uh, data processing tools that are already uh, adopting uh, Velox. For instance, we have a Presto worker that has been implemented on top of Velox. Uh, Spark has a couple of projects. So we have the Spark script transform um, that has been extended to offload exhibitions to Velox. I think Spark uh, script transform is a interface developed in Meta that allows users to execute arbitrary binaries in Spark. And then we have the other Gazelle project that is being co-developed by Intel that can also offload uh, Spark SQL to Velox for execution. And then we have Extreme from, again, from Meta um, that is also 
to using some of the Velox uh, uh, components. It uses the Velox vectors and expression evaluation uh, from Velox. And then there's the PyTorch or Torch Arrow project that uses the uh, live functions that we built in Velox for the Presto uh, worker. So it's use, reusing some of those functions in PyTorch. And then and there's this new substrate project. I don't know if, uh, if you already heard, it's, it's a cross-language serialization for relational algebra. It's, it's essentially, it's a, a framework to yeah, explain, uh, to describe plants and other um, operators uh, for data processing. And that also has uh, uh, extension for Velox where you can uh, translate uh, substrate plan and expression and execute them using Velox. So a lot of use cases uh, having this general purpose and open source uh, scope for uh, Velox. So substrate, like, like is it, is Substrate a subset of everything that Velox can do, or could could is Substrate capturing everything that Velox supports right now? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that, uh, Andy? Uh, like, is is for Substrate like for their you know grammar and what they support? Is that a subset of what Velox can support now, or is it is it almost one to one at this point? I'm not really sure about the scope. It's pretty recent uh, edition, but uh, okay. I know that there's some uh, they added some. So it's, it's actually less than two weeks old uh, uh, contribution. So. Uh, I know they added some support for plants and expression, but I really don't know what's the width of that uh, support. Um, and then Hamid's question in the chat is, Jimmy, are also using Velox? I think no, right? No, Jimmy is not using Velox. Yeah, I think they have, they have their own new engine. Yeah. We have uh, Pedro from Meta. Pedro, do you know what's the scope of Substrate? And <clears throat> Yeah, hi, everyone. I'm Pedro from the Velox team at Meta. Yeah, I think my, my understanding is that those are kind of different efforts, right? Substrate is looking at consolidating query plans in general while VLOX is consolidating the execution engine. So there is one integration that lets VLOX execute uh, substrate plans, but substrates, the scope is much larger and it's also extensible so it can reuse in other engines. So those are kind of different open source projects. All right, thanks. Thanks, Peter. All right, so we, yeah, so looking at the use cases, uh, we already can say that VLOX is um, like providing big wins in terms of consolidation. Um, so we thought VLOX, different teams would have to work independently on each of these data processing frameworks. Each uh, framework, because it's independent, will probably end up with varying semantics. There's overall code duplication. Uh, there are missed opportunities to share optimized algorithms and features. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, often functions as well, that they could end, end up with different semantics across in, in different uh, data platforms. So uh, Velox um, sort of solves all these uh, headaches by providing a shared platform and uh, it will provide significant gains in engineering efficiency, consistency, and as well as uh, productivity. And these are also big uh, advantages um, apart from high performance uh, for, for, with using Velox. All right, so, um, so let's look at some highlights of uh, Velox. So um, Velox has most of the components required to build an execution engine layer. Um, I tried my best to balance the uh, breadth versus the depth that Velox can uh, Velox currently provides. Uh, Velox has many more tricks under its sleeve that than what I will be covering today. So given given it's a one hour talk, I just tried my uh, uh, best to limit sort of the scope. All right. So Velox components include um, types. So types can be scalar and as well as uh, nested complex types like structs, arrays, maps, tensors, and more. Uh, Velox has this notion of vectors, um, and uh, they are uh, sort of very similar to Apache Arrow. They're, they are, they're very, they're compatible in most cases. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to you one case where it is not. Uh, and then it has functions and uh, it has both API uh, to build um, custom scalar and also uh, vector uh, uh, functions. And there's an expression evaluation uh, layer that uh, basically fully um, vectorize expressions over encoded data. Uh, and it also is no, as the notion of tasks, drivers, pipelines, and operators. Um, and yeah, they, they basically co coordinate the um, uh, scheduling and uh, processing. And then there's also this IO subsystem, uh, which includes the connectors, file system, file formats, caching, and network serializers. And finally, there's a resource management that handles the memory uh, map uh, spilling and uh, et cetera. So pretty much these are uh, common modules that you see in most data processing execution engines. All right, so let's first look at uh, what kind of vectors that currently Velox supports. So Velox has uh, various, supports various encodings. It has flat, constant, um, dictionary, uh, bias, and sequence uh, encodings. 
Um, so the fundamental um, to all these vectors is something called a base vector that tracks the type and the nulls uh, and the number of rows. And then there are other and uh, encoding encoded vectors that are extended on top of um, the space vector. So you have flat vectors, for instance, is a base vector and it and also has a values buffer. Uh, you have constant vectors that are implemented over a single value. Um, dictionary vectors uh, contain a values vector and the indices buffer. And uh, bias vector is sort of a delta encoded vector and sequence vector is sort of an RLE encoded vector. And on the right, there's a sample uh, picture that illustrates the uh, simple uh, flat integer vector. So on the uh, left, there's an integer array with some index and logical values. And on the right, uh, it's represented as a buffer of values with a not null uh, vector that indicates if which uh, element is uh, a null or not. So uh, that's sort of what very similar to what Arrow does too. Um, so yeah, uh, all the index two and uh, um, four and five are null. So you have a zero there. And then values uh, corresponding to real values with not null set to one. All right. Uh, so string vectors are uh, sort of uh, unique too. Uh, it's sort of uh, in, in terms of uh, diverting from arrow. So string vectors are uh, based on the Umbra paper. Uh, they have a 16 byte uh, value per string uh, called string view. And they encode uh, the byte size, uh, the prefix of the string, and there's a pointer to external buffer that sort of contains the entire the remaining the, the entire payload, payload. And if the string is less than uh, is up to 12 bytes, then it's it's sort of inlined into the uh, string view itself. So uh, here you can see an uh, sort of a array of bar char. Uh, we have a flat vector with string view, and uh, the va first value orange peel is about is exactly 12 bytes, so it's inlined. Uh, and then the, the next uh, value is tall mountain. Uh, you have a 13 uh, byte uh, string here. So you have a 13 size there. You have the prefix four byte tall, and then uh, it have, you have a pointer to the payload. Uh, and then nulls are again represented as the nulls vector. So this sort of deviates from the arrow format because here we have a pointer instead of offset. And uh, the, the, the main advantage of having a pointer is you can um, sort of uh, have uh, concurrent operations on the element, so you don't have to. You don't have a dependence essentially, uh, because you're not depending on another element's offset. So you can uh, perform operations on these vectors in parallel, out of order as well. And you'll see that um, the size also helps. Uh, so if you have some um, operations that uh, that are like substring or something, you can just update the size. You don't have to really uh, change the payload. So one of the big advantages you can uh, have sort of zero copy or you can try to avoid materialization in most cases uh, using this representation. Um, yeah, actually Arrow also proposed this format in their spec. Uh, there's a mailing, uh, mail, mail, there's a RFC uh, or request a proposal uh, on, on this format, uh, but I don't think it's been finalized yet, but yeah, uh, this is very helpful for uh, ex evaluation of uh, certain operations. Do you, so, do, you compress, yeah. do you compress the strings or do they just sit around the roll text? So, sorry, uh, Andy, could you do, do, do you compress the string buffer? I don't think so. Not, not today. Okay. Um, so yeah, so um, the couple of optimizations with vectors as well. Uh, dictionary vectors provide zero copy for most uh, cardinality changing operations uh, and uh, they are they're heavily used. Um, the, the whole idea of vectorized execution is to avoid uh, uh, materializing intermediate values and Willock sort of provides all tricks to uh, delay materialization how much as much as it can. Um, and also, um, like I said, because of the way the values are presented, all elements can be written out of order. Uh, and, and as a result, certain operations like conditionals can be executed uh, faster. And there's also this notion of a lazy vector that um, does not immediately materialize. It's basically it's a lazy uh, materialization uh, vector so it, it's only loaded uh, when it is determined by runtime filter. So say uh, you have a lazy vector loading some column from a file. Uh, if the runtime filters determine that there's no rows that are needed, so it won't basically load that column. So it, it helps a, in a lot of cases to uh, use lazy vectors. All right, so like I said, dictionary encoded is, is pretty popular and we want to avoid materializing intermediate values. And a couple of operators that uh, end up uh, producing a dictionary encoding vector. So, operator, for instance, produces a dictionary vector 
uh, with columns with a lot of repeated values. Uh, filter operator uh, uses dictionary encoding to represent the subset of the input rows that passes the filter. Um, similarly, join operator, unnest operator, and even functions, uh, for instance, uh, can emit a, a dictionary encoded uh, vector. And again, the idea is to provide zero copy uh, wherever you can uh, for uh, when, when you're executing. All right, so dictionary encoding again. So it can be used to represent both, not just cardinality increase, but also cardinality reduction. So traditionally, when you use dictionary vectors, you want to encode uh, a, a large values into a smaller uh, uh, sort of uh, values buffer. But here you can see that um, the uh, you have basically a, a table with name and colors. Uh, you can encode the colors uh, using uh, indices, but not. But you can also encode uh, names that are associated with color red using dictionary encoding. So it's not just to reduce the cardinality, but also, uh, yeah, to, to also like uh, represent these uh, the other cases. And uh, uh, filters uh, apply to a dictionary column uh, produced by the ORCID. ORC reader uh, adds another layer of dictionary encoding, essentially. So you can see if you have if you have the uh, dictionary vector and you're applying a filter on top. It adds one more dictionary layer, and then if you apply a projection on top of this filter, uh, it'll add another dictionary layer. So uh, we keep the dictionaries can be uh, can wrap around uh, other dictionaries uh, if wherever if possible. And again, the idea is to avoid materializing and uh, have zero copy. Um, all right, so that's the. Uh, uh, like, like if I start doing a filter. Like the output of the filter is another dictionary. Like, like you, you don't you you use the filter on the on the, the, the compressed data, and then what you spit out is more compressed data. Correct. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And yeah, there are there's API to basically flat whenever you need to flatten it. There's API to sort of flatten out all those layers, and you, you get the values out. You were at Vertica. Didn't Vertica get rid of late materialization in their system at like some point? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, I was curious. Yeah, I think just adding to that, that the, the whole point of doing that is, of course, not for primitive data types, because for those types, it's probably cheaper to just copy. But the assumption is that most of the data we're dealing with are kind of vectors of uh, arrays, maps of nested things that are pretty expensive to copy. Yeah, primitives, yeah, it's lightweight, but like, like Pedro said, uh, complex types and strings can be expensive. Um, all right, so that's the. Uh, Summary of vectors. Now let's move on to functions. Um, again, functions, uh, there are various types like scalars, aggregates, and lambda. Um, and there's API to allow users to add custom functions. Uh, it's a friendly API. I have some uh, slides uh, all, uh, coming next. And scalar functions have two APIs. One is a simple row by row, uh, and it can be template based, which is inline. And then we have vectorized, which is batch by batch. Uh, again, there are optimizations that you, that you can uh, provide in functions, like you can specify. Uh, fast paths. Uh, if you know if the input is uh, not null, uh, and you can have the fast path to not null uh, uh, flat vectors. And if you know it's ASCII already, then there's a fast path for that too. And currently, uh, Velox has uh, most of the functions implemented required for Presto SQL and Spark SQL. Uh, you can see on the right, there's a list of uh, various categories of the functions that are currently available in Velox. All right, so and yeah, if you look at the Velox documentation, there's also this nice uh, function coverage map that tells you uh, what are the functions that are currently implemented and what are not. So the ones in green are those which are currently implemented, and the ones in uh, without, yeah, and any of the highlight is sort of yeah, TBD. But these are functions that like Presto supports, and you're you're adding, or like what what is this list? So these are functions that are currently available in Velox, and some of these are uh, yeah used in Velox and so, sorry in Presto and some some in Spark. Like uh, both, these are functions that are like, um, yeah, uh, that are across uh, both of these okay. layers. All right, yeah. So this is a sample function API uh, for a, a row by a row. So you sim simply create a class, multi multiply function, and you have a uh, you you create a bool call uh, with the arguments, and then uh, you implement the function. And then uh, the the important piece is to register the function. So there's a register function API that you need to register uh, with a string to sort of uh, yeah uh, tag the function. So whenever you use this in your expressions, you just say multiply, and then it'll the function registry automatically automatically picks up your uh, function call. Um, so yeah, this is the templated style where uh, you 
uh, create a, a templated function uh, and you can obviously specialize uh, some of the functions. So on, on the top, there's a generic template and bottom there's a specialization for double type uh, for this is a simple multiply uh, again function. And again, uh, the actual uh, instantiation happens when the registration is happening. So you can register uh, individual functions or there's a helper function that will re register all the template possible type templates uh, of the of the function. So uh, there, there, there are some, a lot of these helper uh, modules that uh, can be used for functions. All right, so that's again the summary of uh, functions. All right, so now the next layer is the expression evaluation. Um, uh, like I said earlier, expressions are evaluated in a vectorized manner over an expression tree. Um, and there are two phases that are involved uh, in the expression evaluation. The first is the compilation, and then the next is the execution. Uh, and, and pretty much they, uh, ha they uh, yeah, happen on an expression tree uh, that is built uh, inside using the Velox uh, components. I'll, I'll come to the plan nodes later. Um, so but these are uh, expression nodes uh, and they, they get built in the compilation phase. So the compilation phase pretty much uh, does some optimization. So it does constant folding. For instance, if you have uh, upper of A, uh, where uh, upper is, uh, uh, we know it's a constant, then you can um, sort of uh, create the, uh, you can do a constant uh, folding. And then also it does some conjunct flattening. So if you have a, a sort of a large conjunct of ants, then it, it flattens of all of them. And then there's also this uh, nifty common subject elimination uh, optimization as well. Usually uh, the database optimizer would already do this, but uh, if, if, if some cases, uh, this is helpful uh, to have it here as well. And it also, uh, compilation is also uh, populate some metadata, like it, it, it sort of identifies the behavior of nulls uh, to see if the, the expression is deterministic or not. Um, and then uh, if, if the fields are distinct, and then it also checks if they're conditionals in that expression. And all these are pretty much used to uh, optimize the uh, execution of that expression. So the ex expression uh, evaluation, the execution phase pretty much involves traversing the expression tree with the row mask, uh, which is a selectivity vector, and it identifies the active rows and it only uh, performs the expression on those active rows. Again, the idea here is to avoid materializing intermediate results uh, during execution. Um, and then once it uh, travels, as it traverses, uh, it avoids evaluation wherever it can. For instance, if you know uh, the function returns null for any run, null input, then you don't need to evaluate the expression. You can just update null. And also if there's a common sub-expression sub elimination, uh, this common sub-expression, then you can uh, sort of reuse the results. And uh, it also works on encoded data wherever possible directly. So for instance, if you have a dictionary vector uh, and you want to do upper, if you, you basically have an array of strings uh, of colors uh, uh, and they're encoded as a dictionary vector. Now, if you want to do upper, which basically converts the lower string to uppercase, uh, it directly gets pushed into the uh, value of value, values vector and it just translates those vectors. It doesn't basically do any um, yeah, unparsing or def uh, basically converting the dictionary vector to flat and then back. So it directly pushes into the dictionary vector. And does my upper function need to know that it's actually operating on the dictionary? It's just, I guess you're feeding one scale at a time. It doesn't care where it came from. Yeah, so basically it depends on the metadata. So if it knows it's like the distinct, there's no fields, uh, if, uh, uh, then it'll determine that it can uh, push it inside um, and uh, it'll, uh, yeah, it'll automatically determine. Peter, do you want to add anything here? No, I think just uh, no, I kind of the yeah, the function doesn't need to know about the encoding in that case. So you just provide the, kind of that signature and everything else is handled by the, the expression evaluation engine. Okay, yeah, it's, you implement your function once, not once for like compress, like compress and non-compress. That makes sense, okay. Exactly. All right, so that's the expression evaluation layer and then uh, moving a level on top. So you have these plan nodes and operators that you can compose to basically build your um, execution plan. So the, the, uh, some of these are sort of uh, specified from Presto. Uh, but yeah, they're pretty much uh, full coverage for, I think, most database uh, needs. Um, so you have table scan, you have a filter node, uh, is a, a project node, and you can see like the plan node has a corresponding uh, operator or a set of operators. So a plan node can be mapped to a single or multiple uh, operators, uh, and some of them are actually 
uh, leaf or source operators. For instance, the table scan node uh, has a corresponding table scan operator and it's the leaf node. Uh, similarly, if you look at the hash join uh, on the fifth column, it has a hash probe and hash build operators. Uh, and yeah, some of the other leaf nodes are exchange and uh, uh, yeah, merge exchange and values node. So uh, yeah, a couple of, uh, yeah, I think it has coverage for most operators, uh, at least for what Presto needs. Um, all right, so moving on to the other components. Um, so it has connectors, uh, form, uh, file formats and file systems to support for uh, these uh, modules as well. So connectors, again, I think it's a Presto um, sort of uh, in, yeah, specification. So it, it, it's sort of used to uh, specify a source uh, and it has some uh, nuances like splits, which is the fundamental unit of uh, task that the coordinator assigns. And it has this uh, notion of data sources, data sinks, column handles, table handles, and expression evaluator. So uh, this is again an API that um, I think the Presto um, uh, specification uh, provides and yeah, Velox has uh, corresponding uh, implementation and support as well. And currently Velox has a specific implementation for the Hive connector. Uh, so it has a Hive data source, it has a Hive data sync, Hive column handles, and it understands the partitions and other Hive uh, related uh, nuances. And on the file format side, we have support for Dwarf, uh, which is sort of an extension of ORC. And we have Parquet file for reads. Um, and for on the writes, we have only support for a Dwarf. And on the file system side, we have support for S3, HDFS, and local file system. What is the main bottleneck in your Parquet implementation that requires you to rewrite it? So we currently wrapped it around DuckDB, uh, but uh, uh, we realized it does it, it like pushing some of the dynamic filters and, and other optimizations is not happening. So uh, we, uh, we're actually making that another disaggregated layer where we have a generic uh, reader API and you, you can extend any file format, mostly columnar, like uh, ORC on Parquet and there are other custom formats that I think uh, Meta is building. Peter, do you, do you have other? Yeah, <clears throat> just making a, a quick uh, plug into that as well. I think uh, another thing we observed was that if you look at the kind of main open source readers for Parquet and Orc, like the uh, the APIs they have are not as uh, efficient as they could be. So they lack support for kind of pushing down aggregates and some of the optimized things we did internally. Um, so one of the things we've been discussing is uh, doing what Deepak mentioned, like kind of disaggregating that part as well and maybe providing a, a smaller library that basically has the Kind of file encoding and decoding logic that implements the full extent of the the apis we need but also decoupling that from the memory layout which is most of that is they're either coupled with arrow or like deepak mentioned like that is coupled with uh, that tp's memory layout but, but but that could be decoupled right? i think there's also a separate project which is kind of part of vlox but not necessarily that we we're kind of you know that the, the goal of kind of decoupling the encoder and decoder logic right All right, so and and the I think this is the uh, yeah the other piece um, that like, that I mentioned. So there's a notion of tasks, pipelines, and drivers. Um, so here you have a Velox application, um, and you have this task um, that sort of coordinates the uh, plan or or whatever the the composed composed operators. Um, so um, yeah, it's basically. Uh, um, we have a pipeline of operators here where operator zero is the source uh, and the Velox uh, application basically has this add split or uh, like I said, split is sort of a fundamental unit of uh, a file in, in some sense. So it keeps uh, providing this uh, splits and then the task uh, framework pretty much it um, sort of controls the drivers and the pipelines. So so driver is like a thread uh, in, in some sense. So it, it, uh, it uh, controls a pipeline, um, so uh, and the operators in it. Um, so that's the sort of the uh, setup. You have operators, the pipeline uh, enca encapsulates the operators. A driver controls the uh, pipeline, and then task sort of coordinates everything. It co coordinates the drivers, uh, and uh, it has the pool. It basically, it has some resource management and other things too. Uh, and and the uh, uh, the way the driver works is it basically. Um, coordinates the operator input and output. So it, it uh, so here here I have op and op next op. 
uh, op uh, basically uh, gives the output to the next uh, and uh, next op consumes it. So driver first uh, invokes a get output call from the op, and either you get a null pointer or uh, yeah you get um, a notification that's not blocked, or uh, basically uh, yeah it gets its finishing, and then uh, the driver informs the next op that the previous op is finished. And then, uh, yeah, that's how the protocol works. So the driver coordinates the synchronization. It, it, it checks the get output call, and then it notifies the next stop. And the main advantage of this uh, style is basically the driver can now go off thread whenever uh, it's blocked, whenever the operator is blocked, or I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, whenever the driver is uh, blocked, uh, and it can like basically provide other drivers to uh, to execute. So it's, it's an easy way to context switch you don't without having to put the control uh, uh, stack again uh, when we context switch any questions here all right um so yeah the most fun part is the buffer management which is very crucial for uh, performance and i think has been well studied um, so in Velox, we sort of employ, uh, again, the Umbras idea, uh, where you have this, uh, so the small objects in Velox are directly allocated from heap, uh, but large objects have this mmap allocator uh, inspired from the Umbra work. So we have this size classes, uh, and each size class has the full uh, virtual memory reserved. And behind the scenes, uh, we use mmap and mAdvice to sort of uh, map to the physical memory blocks. And since this is not backed by any physical file, there's no overhead. Uh, so it's sort of a nice way and it also allows for variable size blocks. So uh, you don't have the traditional limitations of like handling, um, basically serializing variable size blocks to, to fix size blocks and have the overhead. Um, yeah, so- I, I, I mean, I use, the MF semantics on Windows are different. I'm assuming this means you're only going to have a run on Linux or target Linux. Yeah. I, 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 Which is yeah. fine. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just like curious if you guys thought that. Yeah, we, I don't think we, I don't think, I don't know. Pedro can help. Pedro, do we have anybody who use Velox on, on Windows? Do, yeah. I don't think so. I think for now we only support Mac OS and Linux. Mac and Linux. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. With the same kernel, yeah. Um, all right. So, and then, yeah, once the buffers are allocated, um, there's this mem memory management that you can, um, yeah, there's a memory manager uh, that controls the allocations. And so allocations basically happen via, via memory pools and they're tracked in a hierarchical fashion. So if you have a nested complex type, the parent has a memory pool and the child has a memory pool. And uh, you can uh, pretty much uh, basically have like this hierarchy of pools. And then the API allows you to track at the top at each level. So you can get to the top level and say, what are, what are or what is all the uh, usage? Uh, and then a uh, task can uh, reserve memory a priori or uh, they have to provide a mechanism to spill to disk. So it's, it's sort of the responsibility of the operator to uh, handle that. And the memory manager uh, monitors the usage and it sort of uh, helps the task to, uh, yeah, to, yeah, to tell basically what are the limits, what, what is current usage and, and limits, et cetera. Pedro, anything to add here? You want to add anything here? No, I think that, that's pretty good. I think actually just adding to the previous question, uh, I think maybe that's one of the main ways why how VLOX and DuckDB differentiate. I think DuckDB focuses a lot more on providing the full DBMS stack in a very portable way. So they support Windows, they support like different architectures. For us, the goal is a lot more providing kind of more reusable components to, for really high performance systems. Right? So in, in that case, the portability, I think it's a little less important in a way. Actually, I have a question. Maybe uh, can you go back a couple of slides back? Sure. Yeah, uh, sorry, can... sorry. What? Uh, front or back? One, uh, front, front. Yeah. Uh, no, sorry. Keep so on going, going. So I'm no, going no, back going. Now. So. Oh, you are going. No, no. So I think I have a more, I have a question on this uh, driver. So you had a slide on driver. Yeah, yeah. So this is the one. The... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. So my name is Aruna. So the question here is this. So you have these various operators and next operators. Correct. And then the driver. So, I mean, traditionally, such a system is implemented using iterator fashion. So when Correct. you have iterators, then you don't need a driver. So, you know, operators are connected and every operator has this uh, init, get next and close. So things happen, you know, 
automatically so my my question is why did you need a driver so that you can easily context switch so that's one of the main benefits right so say you're blocked on an operator uh, in the traditional ways you have to employ other means to uh, like offload that right so how would you do that in, in the traditional iterator iter way you'll be you'll be blocked right uh, yeah, I think right. may, maybe in another way, I think in the previous mode, like we rely a lot more on the operating system to do that, while now we, we control those things in application layer. And I think the, the assumption is that we can be more efficient that way. Oh, I see. So I guess in your case, a driver is a thread and that thread kind of acts as a, as a orchest uh, or, uh, orchestrator. So actually, I actually kind of missed. So in this case, a driver is a thread, you said, right? It's analogous to a thread, but it's actually like, a, uh, yeah, it's an object that uh, basically get, gets, uh, that, that handles the interaction between the operators. Uh, it's, it's... Okay, and then and every operator is a thread uh, as well? No, no. So every pipeline has a driver. Uh, so again, these are just logical, but when, a dri when, you can, when the driver can sort of, uh, say, okay, I, I'm waiting. So it'll go uh, offline and then the other drivers can come and like execute. So it's, it's sort of like a logical way to handle, um, threading. Oh, I see. So me, so maybe, so correct me if I'm wrong, but this uh, operator pipeline operator zero, one, two, three, all the way to N that is controlled by a driver. Yes. Correct. Yes. So the driver oh, basically, it, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, op and op next are basically two operators in this uh, pipeline, like uh, op one and op two maybe. So. Uh, right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. 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 All right. So buffer management, memory management, and then yeah, the other interesting layer is also caching in IO. Uh, again, performance uh, critical layer. Uh, so in Velox, we currently have uh, support for both memory and SSD caching. Uh, again, the caching purpose is to elevate the impact of remote IO latency. Uh, and the smart thing here is memory cache works with the memory manager and sort of it knows how much, how much memory is available. So it will try to reuse whatever is free uh, for the caching purposes. Uh, and then when memory is full, uh, it evicts the blocks that are uh, not popular uh, and it flushes to the SSD cache. Uh, and there's some more tricks as well here, like IO reads uh, can be prefetched and they can also be coalesced. So if you have like a reading from S3 and if, you, if the gap is not too much, it'll sort of uh, coalesce those uh, two reads into one read and it'll wrote, read the entire range uh, from that S3. Um, and uh, again, this gap uh, obviously depends on the, on the file system. Uh, so S3 has uh, more latency, so the gap will be uh, bigger on, on SSD, it'll be different. Um, so yeah, gap is set by benchmarking the storage uh, and then there's also this scan tracker that tracks the access patterns and will recognize, okay, two columns are always accessed together. So we'll try to coalesce them always. So it also exploits temporal locality. So uh, once it loads one column, naturally the other column uh, will be there. Uh, and yeah, it, it can sort of manage, uh, coalesce those uh, reads as well. Asia has a question, you need to go for it. Yeah, so my question is regarding the uh, Raptor part of Velox. So how do you interact with that one? In Raptor, it's specialized for Presto, actually. Yeah, I don't think Raptor is involved here at all. This is native to uh, Velox, this this uh, layer. So Raptor is uh, separate, Raptor X. Yeah, so that I is in addition, or it is, you don't need it? We don't need it because this is like sort of like, uh, yeah, handles data as well as metadata and everything. Uh, Pedro, you can fix, correct me here. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that that's correct. I was just going to say that may, maybe in a way that uh, a way to think about this, that's the C++ implementation of Raptor in, in a way. But, but much smarter. But like, Raptor is also doing multi-cluster caching. So are you guys doing that here? Mm. Yeah, I mean, Raptor, you can have N clusters accessing the same data underneath and you can cache across them. No, not in the current implementation. We don't cache across the cluster. There's no. Yeah, you guys don't do that. The Raptor is doing it, right? Yeah, I'm not sure if we, at least not at Meta, I'm not sure if we use that. It, it might be supported by the community. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll take a look at the Raptor uh, versus this uh, note. Thanks.
All right, so that's the caching in IO. Uh, yeah, so, so extending uh, so over that is the, the SSD cache specifically is backed by files on SSD, where each file of on SSD is a shard essentially. Uh, and the data data backed by each file is selected based on the uh, storage file number. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, file on the uh, remote storage to the file on local SSD cache. And the SSD file consists of integer number of regions, uh, uh, 64 MB size, and yeah, each region has a pin count and read count that you can use to sort of uh, decide to evict or not. So yeah, cache replacement uh, uh, takes basically takes place region by region, and uh, regions that have a smaller read count uh, are sort of evicted first. Um, so that's the SSD layer uh, story. All right, so now let's. So this sort of summarizes all the. Velox uh, components. And the next is the uh, extensibility wins. So um, as we saw, most of the components uh, that I described are extendable. Uh, for instance, Velox users can customize aggregate functions, connectors, operators, file systems, file formats, uh, functions, types, and even caching policies. So uh, this extensibility is again a big win. So, uh, and having an API that is make, that makes it easy to extend is also uh, a good uh, property of Velox. Um, so yeah, uh, so yeah, so pretty much we saw high performance, some of the features that provide high performance for Velox, extensibility, and also consolidation that Velox provides. All right, so that's pretty much the end of Velox. Um, before I move on to Plastissimo and talk about how we used uh, uh, Velox to implement a Pesto worker, are there any questions on Velox? The yeah, the question is, is the local SSD cache Resilient to failures of SUDs. I'm not sure what SUDs is. Or SSDs. Sorry, sorry, sorry. He's asking whether the. Yeah, how many, what are you actually asking? Sorry, you're asking whether. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was off <laughs> mute. So, you're, uh, so, as you said, there's a big gap in performance of. Uh, latency particularly of the S3 and versus local SSD. So uh, when you bring data to the local SSD, is that actually made resilient, you know, with erasure code or something that if it fails, which they do fail a lot, you don't need to go back to S3 and then drag the stuff in, which takes a while. Uh, you know, there's some support that was added for like for uh, CRC, for some yeah, redundancy. I'm not very sure. But do you remember what uh, was added for SSD? Yeah, oh, I'm not sure if we have any type of checksums to the content we have in cache. I think the assumption is that it, it's ephemeral, right? So in the worst case, if something that happens, you just re we need to re read things again from the external storage. Uh, we do have some more on durability, of course, but I'm not sure if there's anything outside of that. Yeah, of course, you can rely on the false systems that they do this sort of thing, so you don't need to do it yourself. Yeah, and I think with that said, the, the whole cache work, I think it's also part of like a, some of the ongoing work. So I think maybe some of those things, it's also like yeah. things that we would be really interested about collaborating and partnering with uh, you know, yeah. anyone interested on that area. Visibility of SSD, all right. All right, um, so moving on to Prestismo, it's, uh, yeah, the meaning of Prestismo is sort of uh, faster. Uh, then Presto, it's a tempo in the music uh, space. It means extremely fast. Um, so the way, uh, so yeah, what is Prestismo? Uh, it's uh, Presto worker implementation uh, using uh, Velox. So currently Presto coordinator and the workers are written in Java. Uh, the idea here is to have a C++ worker uh, written in uh, using Velox and make it a drop-in replacement for Java worker. So uh, customers will not have to do anything extra except to just spin a, a Prestismo process with the same con configuration files that you would use for the Java process for the Java worker, and it'll run out of the box. So that's the end goal. Um, and yeah, like I said, Prestismo is built using the Velox uh, library. Um, so yeah, uh, this is how the big picture looks like. So on the left, we have the coordinator. It is in Java, it does the parsing optimization, and it also manages the distributed execution. And then it's, it sort of ships the uh, task or the fragments to the uh, worker 
and then that's where the Prestissimo sort of uh, uses the Presto protocol to understand those uh, pieces and translate it to the Velox library. Um, so yeah, the plan uh, is split into fragments. Um, this, this all happens in the coordinator. So the, the query plan is split into fragments. The fragments are shipped over HTTP by including as JSON blobs. Uh, and again, uh, connector splits are also, uh, which are the, fund, like I mentioned earlier, the fundamental units for data processing are also scheduled across the workers. And now uh, we have this Prestissimo uh, process that sort of uh, reads from the storage and it does the execution. So that's the uh, end goal. I mean, basically, which yeah, currently works today. Uh, and yeah, the worker has two pieces. It has the control plane um, that sort of uh, is used to coordinate the task and query uh, fragment execution. And then it has a data plane that sort of um, uh, gets the results uh, once uh, once the execution is completed. And uh, yeah, we have the serialized page wire format for Presto um, currently implemented in, in, in Veloc. So, uh, it, it, so we can, the final result, we can translate it to the Presto wire format and ship it off to uh, the uh, Presto coordinate. All right, so if you, if you, let's look at a simple query uh, and I have some slides on how it sort of entire, all, all those things uh, work. So say you have a simple uh, line item query where you're doing a, a filter uh, project um, they, they, so Presto optimizer um, basically um, analyzes this and it generates this uh, JSON fragment um, that gets shipped. It has uh, basically all the details of the uh, plan that needs to be executed and it gets shipped to the um, Prestissimo uh, worker. Uh, again, this is sort of a JSON blob of the split. It has the file location, it has the offsets and uh, other metadata that is required for uh, loading the data. Uh, basically, it has a Hive connector and all that information. And then uh, once the Prestissimo gets the fragment, it invokes the Velox API. Uh, it converts the uh, JSON plan fragment into a plan of, to a Velox plan. Uh, it's a basically a tree of Velox uh, plan nodes that we saw earlier. We have a table of state table scan, filter project, and all those. So it, 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 it converts into that tree. Uh, so for, for the given query, basically, they are this is the uh, plan uh, tree. So there's a partition output, there's a projection, and there's a table scan uh, for, for, for our uh, example query. And then this plan uh, is then uh, sort of further passed into the execution layer. So the inputs to this are the Velox plan and the number of drivers to use. Uh, and then, yeah, there's also a code gen that I didn't talk about, uh, which is currently experimental. It's, it's this, it needs some more love, but yeah, there's all this debate on vectorization versus uh, data centric or code generation. Uh, and uh, yeah, at least there was a recent paper where it's not clear where one is better than the other. It's actually, uh, yeah, it depends on the use case. So um, if, if, if you have a use case that you, you feel uh, code gen is going to be better, so you can uh, code gen the plan and uh, yeah, you, you'll use that for execution. So after op optional code gen, um, there's some more uh, local planning uh, which uh, converts the plan to pipelines and operators. Um, like I said, some nodes are composed of multiple operators and then uh, it optimizes the operators and then it creates the driver factories and then the drivers start executing. Uh, pretty much that's the flow. And this is sort of how uh, multiple drivers uh, work on a single pipeline. So, uh, I'm sorry, there's a driver zero, driver one, driver two and driver three that all work in, on the same pipeline zero uh, and basically they execute in parallel. Um, some pipelines are uh, can be parallel, some pipelines have to be sequential. So uh, the Velox planning uh, planner automatically uh, controls all that. So if it, if it can um, execute something in parallel, it'll sort of uh, spread it into two uh, pipelines. All right, so that's the flow of how uh, the Velox uh, is sort of uh, running or the Pestissimo uh, worker and how uh, Presto can now uh, get high performance just by drop by a drop-in replacement of the Prestissimo uh, worker. All right, so that's sort of the end of the uh, implementation of Prestissimo. Um, and I have some slides on the open source development experience as well. Uh, yeah, I feel the force is strong with this one. Uh, Velox is relatively young, 
uh, in terms of an open source projects. It's been open sourced by Meta around August 8th last year, even though Meta internally has been working on it for about a year or a year and a half or so. Um, so uh, right now, there the are a bunch of partners, uh, include mainly uh, Ahana, uh, ByteDance, Intel, and uh, Meta. Um, and uh, yeah, the community is very active. The PRs are promptly reviewed and addressed. Um, the documentation is up to date. And it's very helpful for beginners, especially run times, uh, building runtimes is not trivial. So documentation is very helpful to uh, extend or add anything. Um, and yeah, uh, there's a good doc there's a good amount of documentation, all the components I, I described today. Uh, and the community also publishes some newsletter every month to sort of um, talk about what progress we have made. And then we have the Velox Slack channel that is used to asynchronously collaborate and communicate. Uh, yeah, this is a sample uh, bullet items of the uh, documentation. So we have the functions that are currently available and then there's a developer's guide that is very, very useful. Uh, I, I, I learned a lot as well from the developer's guide uh, when I was onboarding this project. Uh, yeah, it talks about vectors, how to add a scalar function, how to add an aggregate function, um, again, how expression evaluation works, and uh, there's some debugging tools as well that you can use to uh, debug uh, Velox plans and the runtime uh, statistics that, that are sort of generated when you execute the plan. All right, so yeah, this is a, a sample monthly update uh, uh slide it sort of has uh, a documentation update and what what added features got added to the core library what presto functions got implemented and uh yeah march update had actually had a feature of the month that made it much easier easier to deal with vector functions for complex types uh all right so to conclude Velox is a open source c++ uh, library that helps build data processing uh acceleration library uh, it, it provides high performance, extensibility, and convergence. It has API and modules that cater to a wide uh, range of data processing needs. And it's also a great platform for research and development. Uh, there are some resources here if you want to refer the documentation for Velox and also the GitHub uh, project uh, repo. And yeah, so I briefly have two slides. I didn't really talk about what Ahana is even though, uh, yeah, um, I, the slides all contain Ahana. So uh, at Ahana, like uh, Andy mentioned, we are offering Presto as a SaaS service um, to, uh, to customers. Uh, so the two main pieces, they are, there's this uh, Ahana SaaS con console that is the control plane uh, that sits inside the Ahana VPC. However, the compute plane totally resides in your account or the user's VPC. So that's sort of a big differentiator between uh, us and other SaaS providers because it's in the user's uh, plane, um, the, the, the data doesn't have to move from the user account uh, and it's, it's a, there's, no, there's no security or any other headaches involved. So um, that's a big difference. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're working on a bunch of projects currently. Uh, as you saw, we're working on the C++ worker uh, and uh, planning to extend beyond Meta's needs and uh, make it more general purpose. We have some interesting projects in the optimizer for Presto uh, and again, uh, automatic tuning um, that Andy is working on and telemetry are, are of great interest for us too. Uh, the knobs keep just growing. So uh, some way to automate tuning is, uh, automated tuning is always nice. Yeah, uh, and like here, everyone, uh, you're also hiring. I got a quick question. Um, thank you for your presentation, uh, first of all. I'm just wondering what's the status on the uh, persistent you mentioned before, uh, is it can we, is there somewhere we can get our hands on, on the source code? Yeah, so there's, uh, so there's a, um, so actually, actually this last week, the Prestismo code also moved to the Presto DB project. So you can uh, get the Prestismo layer from the Presto DB project. So there's an oh, great. native uh, folder there. I don't know the exact name, but if you search for native, you'll see only one and you'll, you'll see the Prestismo code there. Great, thank you very much. I, so first, I mean, I'll applaud. To finish up the talk is over. Thank you for doing this. Uh, we have a lot of questions. So, Kareem, uh, why don't you go first and, we'll go, and then we'll go to Hamid. Okay. Um, so, I have um, two questions. Uh, the first question is um, the VLOX in memory format matches at all most of the time or right. for, for many data types, yeah. but sometimes it deviates, like uh, in the example of strings. Correct. Uh, can you 
comment on this, like pros on, or cons of, of doing this? So the pros is definitely uh, to get a high, like better execution uh, opportunities. So like mm-hmm. I said, conditionals can now execute out of order. Um, and um, yeah, so if, if, yeah, if, if transferring data over the wire using Arrow is sort of a less frequent case, then yeah, you want to get as much as possible, uh, better performance as you can and then have the slide over it. And again, it's not too much deviation. I think the payload can be copied as is in most cases. It's just that you have to sort of update those offsets correctly when you write convert a velox vector to an arrow vector. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's sort of a trade-off between high performance versus uh, uh, portability. So Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. My, my other question is, um, what is the best channel to uh, like if um, if I have questions uh, general questions about uh, Vlogs? What is what's the best channel to? Um... So I think if you go to the GitHub uh, project page, there's a Slack uh, link for the mm-hmm. Vlogs project, and uh, mm-hmm. or or I think you have to email somebody. But yeah, all the details are there on the GitHub uh, Vlogs project. Uh, if you don't find it, you can always email me as well, Deepak at Thank you. Thank you for that. Go yeah, so the one thing over here is that the, what did, do you have any performance comparison with Dremio? Particularly, are you also using LLVM or CodeGen? Or no, so like I said, CodeGen is still experimental. We're not using LLVM yet. That's some that, that's some area for sure we need to add, give some more love for Velops. Uh, but com- now answering question about performance, uh, we don't have any numbers yet. So the, the big thing is Velox is just a piece, right? Like so. Um, like if you want to do end to end, a lot of uh, effort uh, or burden is also on the optimizer. So if the optimizer does not generate good plans, then Velox can only do so much. So uh, yeah, we we still uh, are sort of figuring out some. For, so yeah, the current trend is to use TPCH benchmarks, right? So um, we, Presto, I think, still needs some more. Uh, so so we're doing like uh, just pure Velox comparison. So last, but I was actually working on benchmarking uh, last couple of weeks. So we compared DuckDB and Velox just purely, uh, just using Velox. So we we could run. Uh, we have we have a TPCS TPCS builder in Velox where it has plans for some of, for a couple of TPCS queries, and you can benchmark th- that just using Velox. So we compared with DuckDB, and the performance was pretty uh, comparable or, or actually better. But then the next step is basically now use Prestissimo and do end-to-end TPC choosing Presto. But that means Presto should give you uh, the, uh, at least a reasonable chance. Uh, so that's where we are. We're actually looking into some of the plans that Presto generates and uh, yeah, and studying those uh, pretty much. Yeah, so I got one more question for you here. So what is the number of the contributors over here and rank list of the companies that they're doing that? I'm sure that Facebook guys are involved, right? Meta. Yeah, so number of, I don't know the numbers. <laughs> you have to look at the uh, GitHub account to see. It's, it's all open source, so all the contributors are there. Uh, even Meta uh, directly contributes to open source. There's no internal uh, rep, uh, yeah, repo or anything. Everything goes to open source directly. So I, I actually have a question. I have a question, Deepak. So when you said uh, throughout this presentation, when you said a Presto, did you mean a Presto or Trino? Presto DB. So Trino is uh, separate Trino. fork. Yeah. So I think so. My so my question is, uh, I mean, I actually new to this area. So how different is Trino from uh, from a Presto? Uh, it's, it's another presentation. So <laughs> the short answer is no, that. So can, you, can you maybe briefly say, uh, like, what are they the diverged, main points? They diverged, I think, a, a year ago or uh, maybe a year and a half ago. Uh, the, both are separate projects. Both So uh, at, at the high level, uh, at least from Ahana's perspective, we Ahana offering PestoDB is focused more on execution, whereas Trino, I think, is focused more on federation. Um, so uh, that's the high level difference I can tell you from Ahana versus uh, Starburst or yeah, Trino. But at the open source level, uh, yeah, it, 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 there's no, I don't know, there's, there's no specific answer. Uh, so I, I, just, I just posted in the chat, there's that's a link to the Trino talk from last semester. Uh, and they get into a little bit about the, the forking from the, the meta Facebook version of Presto and how, what the Hana was working on. So, yeah, okay, yeah, and thanks. I, and I think Deepak's thanks. comment is correct that like that talk is very heavy on like, Hey, we're, we're doing federated queries across a bunch of data stores. 
Um, all right, so, so my last question would be, um, it's sort of a, a meta question, although Pedro is gone. All right, I'm sorry, meta, like not meta the company, meta, meta. Um, like, what do you see as the future of like OLAP systems with, if Velox succeeds? Like, what is the differentiator? Is it just like the UI, the UX stuff up above, we have the query optimizer? Like, if everyone's using Velox, they're all getting the same performance. What would be, other than a query optimizer, what would be something that would differentiate one system from, compared to another? I mean, within Velox, so sorry, within Meta, I think their use cases to consolidate different processing systems. Like they have machine learning, they have uh, Spark, and they have like, so analytical use cases are all are different. Like, so there will be some modules that are specific to like machine learning or, or maybe Spark, but they will reuse like, come out, so, like the memory allocator and all those can be reused. Um, and uh, so functions, for instance, are used for uh, the PyTorch. So, um, but so yeah, I mean, I think, it, for from a engineering aspect, from a development aspect, this saves a lot of engineering resources because they can reuse um, some of these layers. But at, at the high level, like maybe, uh, but they still have, they all diverge, like Spark is more ETL and uh, Presto is more analytic. So uh, at, like some of the algorithms will, will vary, right? like some of the operators and other uh, modules, won't, won't they be different? Um. Okay, it'd be Velox would be sort of the backbone of the foundation, and then people would sort of implement their own custom functions. Correct. So right now we have like okay, okay, Spark, we have Spark SQL functions different from Presto SQL. So they we have two sets of uh, a, like function implementations, and uh, okay. yeah. So if somebody else needs Spark in Presto, uh, like just some function that they like, they can easily now use that because Velox has that implementation. 